Squad Dam removal that came out a month ago, and actually Outside Magazine just posted it today. It's called Rising from the Ashes, um, El Wall Rising from the Ashes. And it, it's, it's a pretty great story of an expedition we did up into the Elwha headwaters last fall to, doc, to do a snorkel survey to document the comeback of the, the summer steelhead that were extinct. And actually, three years after they were able to pass, we're seeing numbers higher than anywhere else in the state of Washington. So I guess the big lesson is um, I, I don't want to wait another 100 years to, to remove the Chehalis Dam. So, um, you know, pre preventative measures uh, is a lot easier than habitat restoration um, and, and trying to get dams out. It takes so long to get some of these dams actually out. And I do think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity in the Chehalis Basin for dam removal. Uh, with the Wainuchi Dam and uh, especially the Skookumchuck Dam, which became essentially a deadbeat dam this year with uh, Trans Alta Coal, which is the largest uh, emitter of carbon in the state, um, went out of business this year or closed the plant down. And they were the sole reason that dam was on the Skookumchuck. So that's going to be in our focus in the next year is how can we get that dam out and uh, reconnect that really important tributary. Jesse, you got anything to add? I mean, you said it really well. Like, you know, I mean, the best uh, way to remove a dam is to not build one in the first place, um, especially not in an era where it, we're seeing these these case studies again and again. You know, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was really it, it was definitely Shane's idea to include in the film, you know, the kind of notion of like, okay, if we really want to talk, get serious about restoration, it's not just about preventing one dam, but then again, what other fish passage can we create? that's in that same system um, that's right at our fingertips, you know, now that these things are, are not used. So, yeah. You know, and, and dams aren't just for fish. It's, a, it, you know, the conveyance of sediment is so important to beaches. And, you know, the dam proposed in the upper headwaters, there's a lot of sediment that comes off those hills naturally because of the, the geology. It's just a really geologic unstable area. Uh, you know, the 2007 flood was, a 500 year anomaly there's 2500 landslides i mean that's what really caused the bulk of the the damage in the upper basin that being said those big big events are huge for for shaping the the geomorphology of the region and even the beaches and that's those big flood events that's where you get a lot of movement and and changes that that keep the beaches going i mean you know with the elwa prior to the removal i'm there was huge sediment, uh, you know, not uh, problems with Ida's hook and, and some of the beaches kind of disappear, you know, losing their sand from not having the sediment, being sediment starved. And, and there definitely is a concern that this current dam on the Chehalis River will significantly cut off sediment transport, among a lot of other things, um, primarily because it's, you know, in the operation, it's being kind of pitched as to stop, to take the top off these catastrophic floods. But in the operation uh, manual, essentially, it, it says that the, the gates will be shut at 38,000 cubic feet a second in Rochester. Um, and to put that into perspective, all the really major catastrophic floods were 60 to almost 80,000 cubic feet per second. So they're gonna stop a tremendous amount of water that isn't a catastrophic flow, you know, from coming down and delivering that much needed sediment to the, the lower basin. So while it's, while it's kind of being sold as this uh, solution to prevent catastrophic flooding, there's some deep devil in the details about, you know, what it will actually do. Who gets to press the button and when they get to close it and, and who, what authority does that? And then, of course, you know, once something's built, it's, there's just such more justification to use it all the time. Um, so, yeah, the frequency with which that was used would just, like, increase way more than any of the plans or studies that we've, or operation plans we've seen, most likely. You know, and, and, of course, it's being built with a expandable uh, foundation for an extra $100 million is, is the price tag. And, you're going to spend an extra hundred million dollars making a foundation to build a dam twice the size that's permanent. You know, again, well, it's being pitched as a uh, flood retention dam that will only be used, you know, in, in large events. 
once you invest in that kind of infrastructure and once you look at these climate projections of, of more intense frequencies of uh, intense flood storms, you know, it's only a matter of time before that it will be converted to a for a full time, you know, dam with a full time reservoir, which will completely starve the river of sediment. So it's got to pay for itself somehow. I mean, and we're all skeptical that it's, you know, has a lot to do with, you know, development and redrawing the floodplain maps. And that kind of leads me into the next question that Annie sent in, I believe, um, that, and that was referring to the altered sedimentation process and what that might mean for downstream areas like our coastline and one of the bigger beach strategic rights and everything in uh, Westport and Ocean Shores areas. Is that, I, I haven't been able to read the whole EIS, the environmental impact statement yet, I'm still plowing through it, but um, is there any reference to that or is that, I know that's not like top of the priority because obviously this is horribly devastating flooding that they're trying to address, um, but is that in the literature anywhere that I just wasn't able to find it? Uh, I, I saw nothing about any transport of sediment all the way down to the, down to the ocean. I mean, the Chehalis Basin is really big, you know, 3,300 yeah. miles of waterways, 2,600 square mile river basin. So there are a lot of sediment inputs and, you know, this dam would only lower, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of like two inches in Cosmopolis, Aberdeen area. But, you know, there's definitely a, a, a possibility. But yeah, once you get going on these big billion dollar projects, they got to pay for themselves. And, well, you know, there might not be a huge effect in the next, you know, decade or so, maybe in the, the long term, there could be a really significant loss of that important sediment. And we should be kind of thinking about taking out the other dams too, to actually increase some, some more of that delivery. So talking about the, the costs of it, the proposed costs, do you think that um, with the current budget issues that I know the state is facing, um, do you think that might like jeopardize their ability to even build the dam were it approved? Or do you think it might have the opposite effect and you know they're not willing to invest in the restoration that's a little bit more complex and, and harder to necessarily coordinate um, in the future? Do you think that's an issue that's going to affect the decision making process i guess i i think the i think the budget in the in the, the covid situation is definitely going to have some kind of effect on the Chehalis basin strategy as a whole i think i think if the dam were to go forward and that kind of investment was put forth toward a quote unquote silver bullet that there wouldn't be much money left for restorative flood protection measures for other people in the basin. Um, that being said, it's you know kind of being pitched as this uh, like how can we get a net positive with rep, rep, habitat restoration and the dam? And I, I don't know if that's I don't, well. I, I'm pretty sure that's not even possible because one one action takes five years to implement building a dam, and one uh, action to restore that land takes about 80 years to grow trees. So you know, what do you do in the interim, you know, and, 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 and what happens if all the money's spent on the dam and there's nothing left? I mean, that's kind of how this whole process has played out. You know, there's been uh, around over 50 million already spent toward the dam and study so far. Um, so, and not one single habitat restoration project has actually broken ground yet. So yeah, where's the money go? Jesse, you got any? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, like at the same time as that's going on, you know, some of the folks we talked to seem to suggest that the restoration plan was also like sort of, in a sense, like being held hostage to the dam process. And that, yeah, like, the you know, the money wouldn't be released for that. There was kind of a, a hint of that in some of the interviews we did. Um, so, which is, which is funny, because you know, it's like, yeah, we'll give you your restoration project as long as we can build our dam and then the dam gets built and, oh, sorry, you know, we, the money actually got all used up. So, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to, to look at the political kind of side of it too, where people really want their project driven through. Um, so. I mean, you got you, you to gotta also understand like the dam, the proposal to dam the Chehalis is what, that was the catalyst to this whole Chehalis Basin strategy. So that's been the, the, the root goal since day one. 
and the restoration plans and everything else has kind of been to, you know, it wasn't supposed to be mitigation, but it's kind of subtly been mitigation to keep the dam on the table, um, even though nobody will admit those words, or say, you know, say those words. Uh, it, it's clearly, I think the dam would have been killed a long time ago if, if those other components weren't on the table. So it'll be really interesting to see, especially since both tribes have come out against it now, which is very, very powerful in this decision making, um, as well as almost all, well, as all the environmental groups I know. So, you know, are people going to be receptive to other flood hazard reduction measures that we can all agree on, I guess, is, is the, the next big question, but also enhance river restoration work together. Yeah, like the, the restoration work was definitely piggybacking on the dam projects, you know, and still is kind of positioned that way. I mean, the rest of it, isn't it right, Shane, that the river restoration stuff wouldn't even be part of the conversation if it weren't for the Quinault bringing that to the table? They brought, they brought the, they brought it to the table when they came to the table. Yeah. You know? They were kind of, you know, yeah. When they came to the table, they said, you have to talk about this as well. So, and yeah. they also brought the whole restorative flood protection to the table. Um, as well, the whole concept. You did mention, I know there's like pressure to, um, there's obviously a pressure to address this issue because the flooding is so extreme in those places. Um, and you talked about how like the restoration, you know, takes growing old big trees um, that takes, you know, decades. So do you think there are restoration activities that will do enough in the same period that it would take to build a dam to be able to see any improvements or would the levees and um, you know pro like retreat um, and and helping those communities kind of remove those structures from the floodplain are those serious options that you know would also see a benefit in the same five years that um, the dam you know because I feel like the dam promise is a quick fix so I guess is there are there options that can also provide you know a, a fast enough effect available to us i i think that what well, i guess what i was relating to in the restoration side in the growing the trees is more restoration for aquatic species uh, you know i think you would you will see a lot more immediate um benefits from restorative flood protection and definitely you know i mean levees and flood walls are going to have to be a part of the conversation the environmental community is going to have to just deal with that as a compromise i think because there is infrastructure that can't be moved or that won't be moved, I should say, politically or, you know, economically. So, you know, I, I think that's a good compromise um, in conjunction with, you know, uh, land use, you know, changing building codes, you know, the restorative flood protections, a component. And then of course, you know, we have, you know, the growing national conversation at the FEMA and the government level is relocating people out of hazard areas. I mean, it's the number one cost in, in America and, you know, the question is, you know, do we keep bailing out people and businesses that build in hazard prone areas? And that's a that's a national conversation. There was a really good article in Scientific uh, American recently that said uh, relocation of one million houses could save one trillion dollars was, was the headline. So it, it's a very national conversation. And it, for whatever reason, isn't even really a part of the Chehalis Basin strategy conversation. There's no program. I mean, it's a part of the conversation, but there's no program developed. For example, I think uh, in the Quinault comments, they cited something like there's 29 properties currently for sale in the floodplain in hazard areas, and there's no mechanism to acquire those. You know, that's a problem to me. So we really need to kind of rethink that. And that has to be on the table because if, you, if you're not in the way, there isn't a problem. Um, and, and that's the bottom line. The only thing that would avoid that amount of catastrophic flood damage would be within the same amount of time would be just simply to move people. That's, that's the short answer too. It's just like, you know, everything else has a lot more related costs, you know, rebuilding in these areas. I mean, it's, you can see it like you're saying, Shane, it's like 
we see in all these places all over the country and the world now. You know, the people just keep, the, the leadership keeps deciding this is a good idea. And it, a lot of it is property tax based, you know, um, to be able, that the film points out, <clears throat> uh, just to be able to like harvest that, that revenue and keep thing, keep that illusion of safety going. So. I think, yeah, like, I mean, you know, there's going to be climate refugees with climate change. That's, and, and, it, and it's not just islands, little atolls out in the South Pacific. I mean, this is stuff, real stuff that we're going to have to deal with in our backyards. And the Chehalis is one of those backyards. And it, you know, sucks to, you know, tell people they live in a hazard area. But at the same time, if they don't want to accept the responsibility for living in a hazard area and they don't want, you know, there just has to be a really smooth transition to help them out. I mean, we all want to help people out that are in these situations. You know, this isn't, uh, you know, we just want the salmon and screw everybody else. I mean, we, we do real genuinely want to like build a, a climate resilient watershed and not create more problems for future generations. You know, a lot of these climate models that are predicted only go 65 years uh, into the future from now. W what about the next several hundred years? It's only, going to get worse and and the only true safe safe thing to do is to to rethink how we design and how we live in these waterways that is a great segue to uh, any great posed a great question about how does environmental justice play and like how does that play into this and is there a lack of education of the benefits of restoration versus partial retention or is it like a cultural like what was kind of your feel for um, you know, the, the, how that was playing out in the basin. Well, I, I would say like, as far as the environmental justice part, you know, you, and, and kind of climate change in general, it's, you know, the, the Chehalis tribe has done a really good job of, of designing a lot of their infrastructure on high ground. The Quinaults are in the middle of moving their entire village rather than asking to build a seawall, for example, or some hard infrastructure. They're having to relocate their ancient sites and looking at it through a lens of not like, you know, yeah, it's sad, you're gonna lose this area, but like, you know, what can we look forward to? How can we redesign our community, you know, from, from scratch, you know, in a sustainable way? And, and I think if, if you look at it with a little more optimism about what are the opportunities rather than the, you know, this sucks kind of thing, I guess, you know, like, I, I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity to rethink how we design our communities and, and live with these in these places. Yeah, yes, I mean, yes. a lot of it is is cultural attitude, you know, it's like the, the whole manifest destiny and taking of the West and like, just, you know, it, it's that generational attitude. And it's interesting, because the people that don't want to move have been there maybe five or six generations. And then, you know, then you have, like, like you're saying, Shane, like the Quinault, who are like, these ancient sites, it's like, yeah, it sucks, but we're going to have to, what else are we going to do? We're going to take our, our lives into our own hands and scoot up the hill um, and build something better so we can keep our way of life, essentially, just a different location. Um, so, I don't know, I found that really ironic uh, in, in the filmmaking process, just to, to see those two, like, you know, say, oh, we've been here forever, you know, five generations, and and yet we're not really willing to, like, or they're not willing after five generations to look at the true nature of what the land is doing and like adapt to that and take responsibility for that. Um, and in, in talking about buyouts, you know, there's like Shane was saying, there's no financial mechanism in place to, to buy these, these lots out. And on top of that, of course, the, there's not a lot of willingness in landowners to actually like open that conversation whatsoever. Um, so back to what you guys were saying earlier, you know, it's like there needs to be that education and that's definitely not baked in to um, the working watershed, as it were. And um, yeah, it would be interesting to think about ways in which curriculums could like include, um, include much more of that as the science starts to kind of like topple the, the hearsay, you know, in this modern era of like these climate things heating up. So it should be part of our education and people should really uh, yeah. working with nature instead of trying to conquer it hey what a crazy idea lose lose situation in the long term to or get or get plowed by the river again you know it's it's a uh, 
it's, it's, it's a ticking it's a ticking time bomb so I, i'm from florida we build our coasts and hurricanes knock them down every time so i totally know yeah. what that's like um talking you talked about how there's no mechanism or necessarily discussion about like permitting and zoning and things um to the degree that there needs to be at least i wanted to touch on that same aspect but with the with the timber industry um it seems like there and I could be missing it for sure, but that there wasn't necessarily much of a discussion on changing timber practices. Because I know like Weyerhaeuser owns a lot of the land um, and they cut trees according to what the state says you can do. Like they're not like, you know, out of line or breaking any laws with their, with their cutting practices. Is there any discussion about like modifying those rules that seem to have a pretty dramatic impact on our rivers all across? the Pacific Northwest with these timber practices. Yeah, you, you, talk, you talk to anybody in that upper basin that, in the, that experienced the 2007 flood or were affected, and every one of them uh, will tell you, you know, that they have logs in their living room. And, you know, and once you kind of study how, what happened in that storm, you know, there was like 20 inches of rain in a really condensed area of the Willapa Hills. Those 2,500 landslides just unleashed this, like, chaotic flash flood there was no real warning system nobody knew it was coming it happened literally overnight so people got they didn't have time to move and they got hit with what were these um you know flash floods and the first flash floods were caused by landslides damming the river up in on warehouser property and those earthen dams broke and sent a cascade of timber down to bridges and each one of the bridges created a timber dam that backed up and broke and back up and broke. And it was because the, 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 the dams would back up this water. People were seeing like the river rise at these crazy levels and that it, people that have never been flooded before, not even close, were getting flooded, but they could see it was because the timber was backing up on these bridges. And then when the bridges would break, the flooding would instantly be gone from their house. And, and it's amazing how little the timber conversation has been brought up in the Chehalis Basin process, even though DNR is on the Department of Natural Resources is on the, uh, you know, they're one of the, on the advisory board of the Chehalis Basin Board. Um, there was an appendix written about it in the programmatic environmental impact statement that came out last year, but it was super vague. They brushed through the landslide stuff like it didn't hardly exist. Um, and then in this environmental impact statement, it's not even, it's not even like in the, the solutions part or the local action alternative. And it clearly was the catalyst for the majority of damage in the upper basin. And there's no denying that. You just look at the pictures. So it's very political in this state. And it's especially very political in uh, Lewis County. They drive a tremendous amount of money from uh, timber tax revenue from the excise tax, the stumpage tax. And also, they own the land where the dams, you know, uh, them and Vince Pinesco own the land right there, but they own the bulk of the reservoir footprint. So there's definitely stuff going on in the background. Lee, maybe you could chime in about your uh, interactions with trying to ask questions to the Department of Natural Resources oh, okay. in the past few, yeah. few months. Um, I, uh, we, we have a group, uh, we're called the Chehalis River Alliance. And um, we've been meeting once a month for, I don't know, eight months. And um, Shane kind of spurred my interest in, in the forestry practices in the headwaters. And since then, I've been up there, I don't know, 10 times. And um, so I know amongst the allies and other people, um, we're very interested in asking the DNR forest, forestry folks a bunch of questions and so um you, you know we we meet them we listen to them at the Chehalis basin meetings and and i got to know two of the staffers that always come to the meetings and um and we asked to have a meeting with them so that we could um get some of our questions answered and they canceled them they canceled two of the meetings like the day of and then the covid thing hit and then they, we got a, a list of, I don't know, 15 questions together. And I asked them, would you just answer our questions then? And they, they won't answer the question. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's very discouraging. I, and, 
Yeah, and then to walk up in the headwaters and see the soil is highly erodible. You, you know, I think they're cutting up there at 30 to 40 years, and you know, the tree roots just don't have time to hold on to the soil. So, you know, the soil ends up in the creek, you know, right up at the headwaters where, um, where it's pretty easy to see. There's a giant slide and, in, and um, yeah, and it's very discouraging. I mean, even, even if this dam was to go in, uh, you know, a lot of that damage um, and the landslides and came from the South Fork up at Stillman Creek. So that's not going to change. And, and there was a movement to, to reform some of the forest practices in Washington regarding steep slope logging. But I think at the end of, end of the day, it became voluntary, you know, you had to volunteer if you were a timber owner. And you do, you do have to get checked off. Some geology, geologist has to check you off, I think. And, and I know there's still litigation pending against big timber from some of the farmers up there which is kind of crazy to think that was in 2007 and it is still, that tells you how powerful they are. Um, it's a big problem. Now, one more thing to add, which is kind of another piece of irony for me is the, um, you know, like Vince Pinesco, the, the owner of the property adjacent to Warehouser's property where the dam would go in. Um, you know, the slopes right there where the dam would go in are too steep for him to log legally. Um, but yet if the dam, were to go in, all those hill slopes would have to be cut. You know, the whole reservoir would be, all the riparian would be destroyed um, for, for safety issues, you know, of inundation from, from logs and, and woody debris and stuff. So, you know, it's a question of eminent, sort of almost eminent domain, sort of not who, who has the ability and the authority to say who can cut where. And it is very voluntary at this point. And uh, I'll also add that Weyerhaeuser declined the interview for our film. I was wondering if, if they were not represented because they declined that. We should have mentioned that in the movie. <laughs> yeah, they, said, <laughs> they said they didn't have a position on the dam. I mean, we didn't, interv we didn't ask him specifically about forest <laughs> practices because we were curious at the beginning of the filming process more about dam related stuff. And the film, the film itself evolved a lot from the original concept to what it actually became. Um, and we kind of want, you know, it, it started out just about the dam and then it evolved into a story about a basin and a watershed and clim more climate impacts. And we kind of wanted it to be able to live on um, w with or without the dam moving forward in case it does get killed early on. We wanted to have something educational after spending two years on the process. That could also be a model for watersheds all across the Pacific Northwest, and West Coast in general. I think you hit that mark for sure. Like I, I will rewatch that in the future. <laughs> Talk talking about the filmmaking process, and you said how it evolved. Um, I would love to hear a little bit more about like the challenge, like what was challenging a part. Uh, what was the challenging part of filming this? What was the really rewarding part of it? Um, I really loved your use of maps because I'm a map nerd. Um, so if you want to touch a little bit about the filming of of the pro, like that, your job, your role in this, I think that would be great. Well, so I, I got hit up about eight years ago about this damn proposal to do something or to make some peace about it. And, and I frankly didn't, I just kind of blew it off. There's no way this is going to happen. And I was working in California at the time and, you know, and it just never kept going away. It kept popping up, popping up. So about two years ago, a friend reached out and said, no, you really, you really should look at this more, you know? And, and I grew up, you know, out Highway 8, kind of in the uh, Capitol Forest area, pretty close to the Chehalis Basin. So it's, it's a river that I've known my entire life, and, and especially the area up around PL, and, you know, I fish up there all the time for steelhead float. So I, I started digging into it a little bit more, and, and, the, and the whole idea was going to be just to be a, a, an action alert, more of an advocacy issue piece. Um, and, and simultaneously, as I was kind of starting to develop this, Jesse sends me an email out of the blue. I didn't know him prior. And he had actually hit me up about a film I did called Behind the Emerald Curtain about the Oregon Forest Practices Act. Right? And um, 
Jesse, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, so uh, I was incredibly interested in digging into the problematic stuff happening in Oregon, you know, even more lax than Washington's logging laws. Um, you know, you don't have to go far up the freeway before, you know, behind the Emerald Curtain before you see what's really going on. And uh, so when Shane started talking about the, the dam proposal and, you know, learning that it was like the 13th time that this has been tried up there, um, you know, then started to learn about kind of how much uh, timber played in the picture, which really piqued my interest, you know, so like, it's easy to, I was, I was seeing all these like clear cuts and, and, and learning about the whole, all the forest ecology stuff with that. And then seeing the landslide photos in 2007, that's what really woke me up. And just to think like, holy shit, like here's the forest practices, here are bad forest practices, like in action, here's what actually can result from that. Not just houses, houses getting swept away or sedimentation or, you know, but massive sedimentation and massive log jams happening, you know, that caught that basically sort of trumped up the storm as it were, you know, and made a bad thing even worse and even more justifiable to propose this whole damn, um, whole, the whole damn situation. So <laughs> whole damn situation. That joke definitely came up a lot in the filmmaking process. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, uh, that's how we started in with that whole thing and my, my kind of connection to it. Um, I feel like I got off track there, but. Um, well, we want, and we want it, you know, so Jesse came into the picture. So, okay, you know, I got some help. I got, you know, partner in crime here. Let's kind of look at this a little bigger lens. And honestly, I, I started digging a lot into you know, kind of more investigative journalistic stuff at first. And, and the more I learned, you know, the, the more the onion I wanted to kind of unpeel, you know, and, and I was thinking about doing more of an expose at first and, and not really an objective uh, documentary. But, you know, we came to some, you know, early on, we, we came to the realization that we wanted to have a character driven story because this is a very this is the an American water working watershed. You know, this has every demographic trying to trying to figure out these really complicated natural resource problems, um, and and we saw it as a way that it, that it could act as a as a larger model for the rest of the country and the world, and and telling that story through the different voices, the different stakeholder voices, we felt would probably be the most powerful way because. Prior, I, I narrated a lot of my early films, and you know, um, and this we knew this one was going to be a challenge without narration, just because of the complexity of it. But you know, we were adamant to to keep trying. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think we had a lot. Of, <laughs> I think we had a lot of people say, you know, tell us that we needed to voice this thing over, and uh, we really stretched ourselves creatively in in telling the story, and, and decided to you know, really have it come from the mouths of the community, you know, the people that are affected, let's let them tell it and balance. And then we can make the kind of balancing editorial decisions about who gets airtime. And that, and that balance shifted, you know, a lot throughout the edit the editing process, you know, um, there were cuts of the movie that early on felt like a, maybe like a little bit of a damn commercial, you know, <laughs> and then later on it was like, okay, then the environmental optimism is ac actually steering the ship rather than the science. And we need to like reel it back a little bit. Um, so there was a lot of good kind of balancing with um, with all with that process, and and I'd say that, which leads me to the biggest challenge in my eyes, which was just the sheer number of voices, you know, because we would Shane would hit someone up, they'd do an interview, and then they'd have, oh, did you talk to Betsy down the road, you know, and there'd just be like so many, like you know, this fractal of people that you know you you go down the rabbit hole and start following the story, and it and it takes you to more and more characters. Um, and, you know, and still not everyone made it in the film, but we had 40 people in 40 interviewed people in the film. So uh, that was definitely the biggest challenge is like building a balanced story with such myriad voices. It's just like, yeah. Just it, and that broke our own rule, you know? We, <laughs> we were like, we're not gonna have that many characters. We're not gonna have 40 people. It's like, whoa, yeah, we did that. And then somehow it just made some sense. For, fortunately, with like doc, the documentary medium, you, you, you can be more flexible than with the narrative medium, especially following structure guidelines. And, and we were really trying to adhere to specific narrative structure really early on for the first six months. And halfway through, we just had to kind of 
throw that out a little bit and be like, well, if we want to talk about the history, it's going to mess up the structural components here. So, you know, there was definitely some give and take, you know, from a storytelling perspective. Um, and then, you know, the only, I think the only way we were able to kind of weave it together was, you know, by using transcripts, we transcribed all our interviews. So, you know, Jesse and I would communicate a lot via transcripts rather than the actual editing and the software. Like, all right, we need a sound bite. We need to hook, link, link this to that. And, you know, he'd send me a text of uh, or all, this, all the, the transcripts he pulled and then I pulled. And I don't think it would have been possible without transcripts. Certainly not, no. Yeah, just being able to get that objective feel of like what's being said on the page. Um, well, and really just being able to search, you know, like, okay, we need, like you're saying, Shane, it's like, I gotta connect, I gotta connect, you know, the coho to steelhead, like we need a coho steelhead bite. Okay, like, where's that? Who says that? Well, probably a biologist. Okay, we got three, let's look through those, you know, and just combing through. And so like that structure really helped us like find the right, um, the right pieces for the story that like we wanted to tell. because you know, 40 people, 40 versions of history, and um, but ultimately trying to really decide like what story we're gonna tell and make it that that kind of larger watershed discussion that people can find a little more timeless, hopefully. And and Jesse, oh yeah, go ahead. Jesse did all the maps and the, all the motion graphics too, so. Uh, they were awesome. I, I, was, I was like, eh, hey, these are great. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, and master storytelling weaving. I, I thought it was a beautiful transition from one story to another, and I didn't feel like it was, you know, trying to heavily bias me in any direction. I felt like you did a good job, like telling those, those or letting those people tell those stories. So yeah. It, it sounds like your idea for what the film was going to be kind of shifted over time. Did, did your opinions on the, like, on the proposed dam in general, like going into it and coming back out of this project, having interviewed all those people, did your, attitudes and ideas about about the proposed dam shift in any way in any direction i mean it, it is interesting to hear you know the you know sit down for a few hours with the proponents and hear them out you know i and i will say you, you do feel compassion for some of the, those people and you you get in and you feel you know, what the catalyst for why they're making certain decisions and where they're coming from. And, you know, it, it really, at the end of the day, it really does come down to kind of just different ideals and, and different ways you look at the world. And, 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 and we see that so much in our political culture and, and everything. And it doesn't matter what natural resource conflict, you know, a lot of it comes down specifically to ideology. It's not like, you know, someone's got it out to you know they're going to sacrifice the salmon for the you know development or whatever you know it's it, so I, I would say that you know I, I definitely walked away from some of those interviews um a little you know a little more aware of of that side of the story jesse do you have any but it didn't yeah. change my overall no, I, I would really echo what you were saying. I mean, I felt the same way. Like there were moments where, I mean, I, I also remember that first moment where we like, we're like, oh my gosh, the dam actually is the only thing that can hold back that much flood water. They're right, you know? And like, that wasn't a like, oh, the dam's a great idea, but making that, like realizing that honestly, you know, it's like, yeah, like that, that is their goal. And just like people have different worldviews, people have different, expressions of, of that like in their life goals and like if your life goal is to hold back a bunch of water then that's the the biggest way to do it you know so they're meeting a certain they're answering a certain question with the proposal um but again like once you zoom out and you're like asking a bigger question like how can we make the, the watershed resilient into the future then you start to see these different things coming out of the table rather than control nature stop it you know um yeah and and like it's it is a catastrophe you know floods are horrible and these people have had like yeah sitting with them and interviewing with them they've had really there's a lot of trauma that's stored in those communities and you know they're they're wanting some solution is a very righteous and like real 
want, you know, but again, sacrifice the salmon, maybe not. <laughs> on that question, on that, on the topic of salmon, uh, Lee asked a great question about, um, you know, you mentioned the documentary, the threat of, you know, two sam salmon species, especially the spring chinook run. Um, and there is uh, talk of the possible listing of it and, um, of spring chinook in the in the Chehalis as uh, and under the ESA. If that were to go forth, how would that change the the whole process of the Chehalis Basin strategy? Well, it would change in a few ways. It would make it much harder to permit a dam with an ESA listing or even a petition for a listing um, on the federal side. So we just got wrapped up with this, or we're just next. This Wednesday is the end of the comment period for the state environmental impact statement and the federal environmental impact statement was known as the NEPA. That kicks off, I think, sometime in mid to end August into mid September um, is what their goal is. So ESA is much more of a federal deal. So that would definitely come into consideration there. Also, what ESA does is it allows um, a lot more resources for river restoration and funding into the basin. You know, one of the big problems with the Olympic Peninsula, you know, salmon restoration on the Washington, the whole Washington coast, including the Chehalis Basin, is a lot of the resources get directed to ESA listed places like Puget Sound and the Columbia River. So it, it would have both an economical positive I think, and it would also, I mean, it's, 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 it's needed for sure. The, the, the fish are, they're overestimating how many there are now, and there's not that many what they're estimating. So, and, and we know this from new genetic work. So they are in dire straits and the climate models aren't, aren't gonna make that any better. I just wanted to plug that like, that was, I thought a very powerful moment in the film where um, I think the tribal member it was was talking about how like spring chinook like the cultural importance of it and how like you survive through the winter and then this is like you made it you know chinook like start coming into these rivers and bringing those resources and I was just like wow like that just that like really struck a chord with me I was like wow these are so important like if you think of that like like hundreds of generations just like hooray we made it through another winter here they come and just the, the symbolism of that um, there's, I just thought that was a really powerful moment in the film. And it's not just unique to the Chehalis Basin. Yeah. Like, Spring Chinook is the sacrament of all these Northwest tribes because it was the first salmon to come back from California, you know, all the way up into Alaska. So um, it's a, it's, and, and, it, and Spring Chinook are in dire straits everywhere. The Chehalis is actually doing pretty good. I mean, there's like, you know, if, I mean, if we can recover Spring Chinook and the Chehalis, then, then it could be what we consider a stronghold. I mean, there's, you know, South Umpqua down in Oregon, they counted 27 last year. Um, not in the Klamath River where, you know, the largest dam removal in the world's happening. I mean, on the Salmon, the Salmon River uh, tributary of the Klamath last year, they counted 100, you know? So, I mean, they're down into low hundreds and, um, even you know single digits left uh, all, all up and down the west coast so it's not salmon river in idaho that was named after the spring chinook salmon i heard uh, last year in august on the red survey they didn't even count a single red so th if there's one species of salmon that's you know at risk of going extinction across the whole range it's the spring chinook and they're the ones that have adapted to these really adverse conditions because they have to over summer and find these cold water refuges and sanctuaries. So, you know, I think we need, you know, as a whole West Coast need to start putting a lot more resources and attention on, on those and not just lumping them into just salmon in general, because they're, you know, not only culturally important, but they could have the genetics that can deal with climate impacts. Um, but that being said, once that, um, that, genet that allele is gone, that specific run timing gene called the Greb1L, then it's gone forever, so. 
is there any discussion when they're talking about the costs of these dams? And I know you showed a great graph. I don't know where it came from in the film about like the return on investment of a dam versus restoration and how much, how much more you get out of um, habitat restoration efforts typically. Um, so, but one question I had is like, I know like I've worked for state agencies doing salmon work. I actually surveyed some culverts in PL and Chehalis and I walked to China Creek, which is like a concrete bloom for a good bit of it. Um, to, to correct those passage barriers for salmon. I know how much money is invested in, in protecting and restoring all the, the salmon runs. Um, and then there's the new Orca Task Force, which you know was allocated a good bit of money to try to recover um, our, our orca population. Is there any talk about like the cost of the dam to these other efforts that we already spend way more money trying, like, you know, it's like playing at odds with each other? Is that in that conversation at all that you've seen? I mean, it's in direct correlation to, to all of these other efforts the public is investing in and ORCA, you know, I mean, there's significant evidence based off ORCA feces that they spend a lot of time off Gray's Harbor, you know, and some of those Chinook stocks. Um, that is in the EIS, um, but it does, you know, yeah, putting a dam and wiping out one of three spawning areas for spring Chinook in the whole basin, that is at odds with, with, the, with what the general public is asking for in the state of Washington and how much the general public has invested in habitat restoration to recover salmon uh, in the entire state. All right. Well, those are most of the questions I had. Um, we're getting close to time, so I wanted to end on kind of a more positive activist note. Um, so can you guys talk a little bit about, um, you know, how people get involved? There's obviously the comment period that is going to be open to the public um, on, that ends on Wednesday, which is why we're trying to sneak this in here at the last minute. Um, and thank you for making your amazing documentary freely available on YouTube um, prior to this. Um, yeah, is there anything you want to discuss this like plug for people getting getting active and involved in this process going forward? I would say go over to PacificRivers.org. Uh, that's the organization that I've been with for the last five years. And on the homepage, we have a take action button, or you can go comment uh, straight to the Department of Ecology website. You know, it is good to, you know, when making public comments to instead of signing on to a letter necessarily, it's, it's, it's sometimes better to send a personal note um, and your connection to rivers or the basin or oceans. Um, so I recommend going and making a comment there. And um, Jesse, do you have any other? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the place we're trying to focus all the energy right now. Um, that's, that's kind of the outlet. Um, and then, you know, if there's a federal process that'll continue um, thereafter. So we'll see what happens with that. But um, right now that this is the, the point of focus and that's that's why we decided to make the film freely available on YouTube you know it was a little bit of a shock to um, have this whole COVID thing hit and not debut the film in a theater but um, the first three days that we had it on YouTube we were able to reach actually a, probably a lot more citizens of Washington than we would ever be able to if we had tried to pack people into a theater and charge them eight dollars a ticket so um, so we're grateful for that kind of silver lining there hopefully that helps give some juice to the damn fight and Lee had, Lee had mentioned earlier too, we have a coalition website called the Chehalis River Alliance, so .org, ChehalisRiverAlliance.org, so go check that out. There's an action alert there as well. Um, and the film will start, the film's gonna come offline on Wednesday and it's gonna start being uh, aired on PBS on KBTC here in Washington on June 11th at 8 p.m. So if you know anyone out there that wants to, to see it via TV, I, I have a burning question. Oh, <laughs> um, Yay. I know, um, there's also a ton of information on the Chehalis Basin Strategy website, which is a Department of Ecology website. And Shane and Jesse, I noticed that um, your, your film is posted on the website. Really? Which, yes. Really? <laughs> there's a link to it. We knew there was a press, there's a press email that went out, but it's actually on the site, huh? Wow. It's, yeah, and so I, I, I really want to know, have you heard from like Andrea McNamara-Doyle or Edna Fund? Nope. Or no, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, are they happy with the film? 
I don't know. I oh, sent wow. emails out. I didn't hear any hear anything back. Yeah. That uh, you know, their acknowledgement is perhaps the greatest. Yeah. That's that could be it. You know, we may never hear from them at all, and that. Yeah, it's right at the top. Um, yeah, it's it's front and center, which I think is a real tribute to you two. That's awesome. I mean, no, I mean we, you know, we we did we genuinely went into this thing objective. You know, I might have had an opinion or two before we started, but you know, <laughs> I I do respect people's time and you know being vulnerable to being in front of the camera and you know the last thing I wanted to do was you know take advantage of that you know I, yeah. I feel like integrity is really important in documentary um so I mean I'm I'm confident with what we put in there I, I don't feel like we made anyone seem or feel like they weren't in real life I guess yeah I mean the with our goal is to you know it's like we in, in selecting who says what, you know, it's like, are, can we stand behind this? And moreover, can we stand next to them, next to that person, you know, on a, on a panel and, and discuss what was said and hold them accountable. And so, yeah, we, everything that's in there, we can do that with, so. <laughs> there was no villain. <laughs> But the river's the villain. I know, but we're trying to save the river. <laughs> but the it dam's the villain. Yeah the, yeah, the dam's the hook, that's for sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Is there any other questions out there? Oh. Uh, am I live or can you hear yeah. me? Oh, okay. I was going to type it. Um, is there any talk of uh, getting wild and scenic status on the Chehalis? So, you know, our. Uh, Pacific Rivers works on wild and scenic all over, you know, Oregon and Wild Olympics and Montana and, and the Chehalis, you know, there's tributaries. So in the Wild Olympics bill, like the upper Wainuchi and Satsup and Hump Tulips and that's all in the Wild Olympics bill. But it's really hard on the West Coast to get designations without um, public land. It's, uh -oh. it's, it's almost impossible. Okay. Uh, on the East Coast, they're they figured out a way to get, you know, private land designations of wild and scenic. So hopefully that momentum can carry over um, to the West Coast. But since so much of the basin is predominantly in private timberland and agriculture, um, you know, it's, unless a lot of that floodplain gets locked into, you know, public lands, which would be awesome someday to create one big greenway, they could be wild and scenic. I mean, yeah. maybe that's a great goal to have, you know, eventually, you know, like let's, because that's, that's another big problem with the Chehalis. You know, Lee was saying that she didn't see anyone on it on the whole float trip. And that's big reason because there's like no public access hardly. And, yeah. and, the, and the public access that is there, it's kind of like you got to know someone that knows someone to kind of figure out where it's at. Um, and, and I think that's a huge problem in, in pe getting people in Washington to care about the Chehalis is they only see what's next to I-5 and, you know, it's essentially an irrigation ditch. They don't see the beautiful parts because it's hidden, you know, so. Or realize like how much it, it contributes. Mm -hmm. um, so such a diverse river. I mean, it's, yeah. it's got incredible, all, you know, the genetic diversity in salmon is, second to none the amphibian diversity is second to none the migratory birds that come in is you know amazing um it's just got all these different unique bioregions um, that really make it a, a unique and special place that we need to work to kind of enhance and, and build climate resilience and recover the whole ecosystem because if there's one if there is some spot you can recover salmon in washington state that's where i would put my money if I was to put my money on it. Cool. There is hope. All right. Any other last last questions? Thank you guys so much for spending your time and for everybody for showing up on happy Memorial Day evening. I hope you all had a great weekend. Um, I did want to say if you wanted to donate to the film, hopefully that is the right link. Um,
but if not, you can go to PacificRivers.org and then they'll, they'll have a link there too. Um, I definitely donated. I have friends that make right. documentaries and it's not, it's not profitable business. You're not going to get rich, but it's so important. And so I definitely encourage you all to show your appreciation um, and support. So much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. It was a great, great film. Very well done. I watched it twice. I'm just saying. Twice. <laughs> So did we. Uh, we, we had to do it. We watched it twice. Yeah. Well, we'll have to come out for a surf with you all sometime. That sounds fun. Yes, we're please. a big group float of the river. You bet. <laughs> group float. <laughs> can, I, can I float the whole thing in, a, in an inner tube? Is that, oh, yeah. is that doable? <laughs> Sweet. Good field trip. No problem. <laughs> Next chapter meeting. <laughs> Bring some GoPros. Stand up paddleboard the whole thing, probably too. That'd probably be fun. That would be dope. I got lots of paddle boards. Anybody <laughs> want to do it with me? <laughs> I'm getting Mike. Are you in San Francisco? Yeah. Is that where you are right now? Awesome. Well, <laughs> thank, you. thank you guys again so much. And Thanks. I think. <laughs> I don't know. Somebody's on. I'm going to mute you, Christy. All right. Um, we will try to. We recorded all of this, um, and so we'll try to post this on uh, Surfrider Olympia's website, which I'll post at the chat box. Um, if you have to check out the chat box, there's a bunch of links, but I'll try to make sure they all find their way uh, to a website so you guys can uh, access them for that information. Um, yeah, go go submit your comments. Um, and you know, raise your voice because uh, you're a citizen and your voice matters. And so we got to speak up for the rivers yeah, and the fish to, and the people and everybody. You got to fight. Right. Well, thanks so much for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you guys for your eyes and ears. It really makes a difference. Yeah. Thank you Cheers. so much. And thanks, we look guys. forward. I look forward to watching your future films. Yeah, Klamath River. We're doing the Klamath River dam and removal. Dam removals. The five five year project. We're starting this weekend, next weekend. <laughs> but you're starting the five years, so in five years I'll I'll be ready for. Yeah. <laughs> and we're gonna film the Nooksack Dam being blown up oh, this summer too. Awesome. <laughs> Definitely gonna keep an eye out for that. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> That'd be a fun one. Awesome. All right, guys. Have a great night, everybody. Well, have a day. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Night. Thank you. Everyone's got to figure out how to leave now. <laughs> I know. I got to figure out how to stop recording. <laughs>